All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you guys for coming out. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about uncertainty in AI, uh, and we're going to be working on building an email spam uh, classifier. Um, so specifically, what we'll be talking about today, uh, we'll start with uh, discussing uncertainty under uh, the scope of AI. Uh, then we'll give a brief review of some probability that would be uh, important to know for uh, the programming part of this. Um, and that will also provide an introduction for Bayesian networks. And then after we discuss that, we will go right into the programming, and then we'll do a little review and talk about how we can actually improve upon what we coded today. Um, so uncertainty under the scope of AI refers to uh, some set of values. And the problem of uncertainty in reasoning is extremely difficult and complex, uh, and actually makes up a large subfield of AI. Um, and this is often because information that is made available uh, to intelligent systems designers for model construction and reasoning is often incomplete or doesn't really provide enough information uh, to produce accurate results. And uncertainty in one part of a model can actually propagate throughout uh, the rest of the model and can cause uh, issues further down the line. Um, uncertainty can be caused by randomness, problem complexity, ill-defined concepts, lack of knowledge, and uh, exceptions to general as assumptions. So now we'll start talking about probability. Uh, probability theory can be used to represent and process uncertainty. Uh, and probability is really just a tool that we can use to combine information and provides us a natural way to describe our assumptions in numbers. Uh, so if we look at the scale we have here, uh, zero means that some event uh, is impossible and won't happen, and a probability of one means that some event is certain and will happen, and then anywhere in between uh, portrays varying uh, degrees of possibility. Um, and in practice, uh, probabilities will very rarely evaluate to zero or one, um, but you know that's just a quick little side note. Uh, when we talk about probability, there are two main interpretations that we go with. Uh, relative frequency, where the probability of an event represents the frequency that uh, some event will happen in repeated trials. And this is often what we are taught in class, our statistics, uh, where let's say we have a coin and we want to flip it ten times. Uh, what's the chance that we will get head five of those times? What's the chance that we'll get tails you know, six of those times? That's kind of what we're thinking with relative frequency. Uh, and then we also have a degree of belief, where the probability of an event represents an agent's degree of belief that an event is true. And this is a more general view of probability. Um, and this is the interpretation that we will be sticking with today. Here we have um, some probabilities. So we have A and B uh, in some of these images. And those are just propositions. So those represent um, something happening in the world. So a can be the probability, or um, sorry, that it's raining today. Or A, in our case today, will be uh, whether or not an email is spam or not. Uh, so in this first diagram, we have the probability of A, which will just be everything inside this circle uh, that represents A. Then when we have the probability of not A, it's going to be everything that's not including A. Then if we type the probability of two propositions together, uh, we assume, or, or we take in all the, the knowledge from both sets, um, it will just be the intersection of the two. And then if we take the probability of A or B, it will be both sets uh, with everything inside uh, considered. And then from here, we have uh, unconditional and conditional probability. So uh, the P, P of A here stands for the probability of A. Uh, and that is the probability that A is true, not the probability that A is false. Um, and if the probability of some variable is unconditional, that means that uh, the value is not dependent on any other variable. So here, the value of, or the truth value of A is not influenced at all by the truth value of B. Uh, and this is also commonly referred to as marginal probability. Um, and then we have conditional probability. So this notation where we have the probability of A and then this line and then B is just the probability that A is true given that B is true. 
uh, and the truth value of A is dependent on the truth value of B. So below we have a, a separate example, and this is the probability of C given A and B, uh, and this is the graphical representation of it. So uh, we can't really derive C's value unless we know the truth value of A and the truth value of B given some set of circumstances. And from all of these uh, probabilistic axioms, we can uh, create some probabilistic rules. Uh, for the first rule we'll be talking about is the sum rule. Um, and this can apply to any number of variables. And I really think the best way to talk about the sum rule is to go over some examples. Uh, so first we'll introduce our uh, propositions. So proposition A is um, arm pain. So whether or not a patient has, uh, is experiencing pain in their arm, um, B is whether or not there's a positive x-ray, so whether or not there's been identified a fracture or a break. And then proposition C is whether or not um, the, uh, an individual's arm is broken. So we'll ask, what's the probability that someone has a broken arm? So this can be simplified to the probability of C. And then using this table over here and the sum rule, what it states is that we'll just take the sum of um, all values where C is true. So we have A and B, which is lowercase, which means we're not really paying attention to those values. And C is uppercase, so we want to pay attention to that value. So we'll go over here, and we'll take from each row, or yeah, from each row where uh, C of, is true, which has a value of one. So these four, and we'll go ahead and sum those up, and that will give us 0 0.253. So what is the probability that someone has a broken arm given that they have a positive x-ray? So this can, again, be simplified to the probability of C given B. And now B and C are the values that we're looking for to be true. And so wherever B and C is true on this table, we'll take those values and we'll sum them. And that will be our probability of 2.18. And then finally, what is the probability that someone has arm pain given that they have a broken arm? Uh, so this will be the probability of A given C, and now we're just looking for A and C. Take the sum where both A and C is true in our table, and that will give us a probab uh, probability value of 0.138. Does anyone have any questions about that? I know that was a lot. Okay, awesome. Next we have the product rule, uh, and the product rule states that P, uh, the, the probability of A and B and C can actually be simplified to the probability, or not really simplified, but changed from the probability of A and B given C times the probability of C. Uh, and that is also equivalent to the probability of A given B and C times the probability of B and C. And then if we iteratively uh, apply this rule to a certain uh, probability, we actually get the chain rule. Um, and as we see here, we'll, ha we'll have the probability of A and B and C all the way down to Z, uh, and that equals P or the probability of A given B and C all the way down to Z times the probability of B and C all the way to Z, saying a lot of letters. Uh, as we go down, uh, just keep iteratively applying the rule, we eventually get the probability of A given B and C and Z times the probability of B given C and Z. You can see as it kind of goes down all the way until we have one variable left, which is just the probability of Z. And then we have Bayes' rule. Um, so Thomas Bayes was an English minister and mathematician who lived throughout the 1700s. Um, and fun fact, he actually, uh, it's actually widely believed that the paper that describes Bayes' theorem uh, was found after uh, he was dead, and it's widely believed that he was trying to use this theorem to prove the existence of God through mathematics. Um, and as we see, we have Bayes' rule here, which is the probability of B uh, given A is equal to the probability of A given B times the probability of B over the probability of A. So what is a Bayesian network? Um, it's a probabilistic graphical model that represents a set of variables and their, de uh, their dependencies via acyclic directed graphs. So we have a graph over here. The nodes represent the random variable. And then the directed edge uh, represents the conditional dependence between two variables. Um, so the lack of an edge, like we stated before, between A and B, this means that the value of A does not influence the value of B, and vice versa. But 
we cannot get truth value of C without first having NB. Um, also, to keep in mind is that the graphs must be acyclic, which means that there are no loops anywhere in the graph. So if we had arrows going from A to C, then C to B, then B to A, that would be a loop, and that would not work uh, for a Bayesian network. So why do we want to use Bayesian networks? Why are they useful? Well, they make, um, they make it easy to manipulate full joint distributions. They take advantage of dependency properties that we've been talking about, and they're really straightforward and easy to work with. It helps simplify uh, a lot of the work that we'll be doing. So here we have an example of a Bayesian network with the values. Now, these uh, tables that we have for each node are considered concise, and the reason for that is there's only one value, and this is just the value when B is true. And we can assume uh, what the value is when B is false by just taking the complement. So if probability of B is 0.7, then the probability of not B would be 0.3. Then the same holds. Um, and given our understanding of uncertainty and this knowledge of Bayesian networks, uh, we can now begin to move on to um, a specific model called the naive Bayes model. So a naive Bayes classifier, um, it belongs to a family of probabilistic classifiers and has very strong independence assumptions. Um, and it's actually these strong assumptions that make this classifier quote unquote naive. Um, it makes the assumption that all features are conditionally independent from each other, uh, when in reality they, that may not be totally true. Uh, and we'll see this more as we uh, start to talk about it in context. Um, and, and just as a general note, Bayesian networks uh, tend to make assumptions about variable independence uh, in the world in order to uh, provide concrete data, but the naive Bayes classifier has some notably stronger assumptions. Uh, the naive Bayes classifier for email spam classification treats each word in an email as independent from every other. So we can think of each of these nodes down here as words, and this is the email. Um, I'm sorry, this is the probability uh, of, of it being spam. So down here, right, there's no uh, directed um, pass from variable to variable. Uh, but we know as, as humans and not robots that, you know, words mixed together can have different connotations. For example, we have the difference between very good and not good, right? Our uh, naive Bayes classifier wouldn't really be able to d distinguish the difference between that, but we know that there are two very uh, different connotations behind those sets of words. Um, but that being said, naive Bayes classifiers are still widely used in text categorization, and they're extremely robust and are highly scalable. So that's why uh, people like to base a lot of their models off of this. Okay, so now we'll start talking more specifically under the scope of email spam classification. Um, today, we'll be using, or we'll be building a naive Bayes classifier in order to check whether or not some email is a spam email or a ham email. And um, a ham email just means it's a legitimate email. It's a terminology that is commonly used. Um, but before we get too far into this and we start programming, we, I want to talk about uh, the two main phases uh, that we'll be kind of dealing with um, when building our um, classifier. So the first phase is training. So here we have our set of training, uh, training data, uh, and we'll go ahead and analyze each email one at a time. Uh, and by analyze, we mean um, we need kind of a model to evaluate each email. And the model that we'll be using is the bag of words model, where we just count the occurrences of words that occur in spam emails and the occurrence, uh, the occurrence of words that appear in ham emails. Um, and when, when we're training, um, we know whether or not email is spam or ham already, so this makes it very simple. Uh, we don't need to guess. There's no guessing yet. We have all the information that we need. Um, and from this, we can derive the probability that an email is spam and the probability that an email is ham. And um, these probabilities are just... Uh, the percentage of our training data that is spam and the percentage that is ham. Okay, so the second step 
is testing. So now we have a separate set of data, which is our testing data. Um, and it's very important that these are separate. Right? If we're training and testing on the same data, we're not really getting anything out of it. So we need to be testing on completely separate data um, to make sure that it's actually working correctly. Um, so first, we want to take our testing data and classify each email. And then we, when we are classifying each email, we determine the probability of it being spam and the probability of it not being spam. Um, so this is done first by analyzing the email, assuming that it is spam. And this process uh, just consists of multiplying the probability of each word in that email um, being spam. And then we repeat that process, assuming that the email is a legitimate email. Um, and that should about wrap it up for that. Um, and then, oh, right, the most important part, our result. Uh, so if the probability that uh, an email is spam is greater than the probability that the email is not spam, then we can conclude that the email is spam and we can get rid of it. Okay, so now we can get into the programming section. Uh, if you guys want to follow along, here is a link to the Google Collab. Um, it, everyone should have access, but there's been some difficulty accessing everything. So I'll give you guys a few minutes to navigate. Okay, so everybody should be seeing something like this. Is anyone having trouble getting to the collab file? All right, awesome. So before we actually start implementing the classifier, we should just go through some of the more structural stuff uh, for the program, uh, just so you can kind of familiarize, familiarize your guys' selves with it. Um, so we are building uh, the classifier as a Python class. Um, and then we have our init, which will be called whenever uh, we construct an instance of a naive base classifier. Um, so we have our alpha, which is just used um, for smoothing when we encounter a word we, we have not seen. Um, and actually, in our case, it's just used when um, a word isn't in the dictionary. So it's, it's just uh, assisting so we don't get probability values of zero, essentially, because uh, that will mess up the calculation. And then we will establish the probability variables um, for the probability of an email um, being spam and then probability of it not being spam. And then we have two dictionaries, one for the spam words and one from, uh, for the ham words. And this is where we keep track of the occurrence. So um, we can actually go to these helper functions here real quick. Um, so we have this add word function here, which just adds a word to the dictionary. So if that word's already in the dictionary, we'll just increment the count. And if the word isn't in the dictionary, then we'll just initialize it with a value of 1. Uh, and then finally, we just have some um, variables to keep track of the number of spam, ham, and total words uh, that we've evaluated during our training. And then below, right, we have some helper functions. Um, and this is just to kind of obfuscate uh, some of the more technical Python stuff, so you guys can focus on really just um, the uh, implementing the AI. And then we also have our main function here. So we have this, these helper functions. Uh, process data helps us get the data set and all the information from it, and then get email text just gives us the text of the email. And then our main function is really what runs the whole program uh, and gets it going. So we have our data path. Uh, I previously uploaded this CSV file, which is this, and it's massive. 
this is just a bunch of spam emails, ham emails, all just in a giant CSV file. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and uh, build our classifier. We're calling it classifier. And then we'll take our data set. So we're going to process our data path, which is the CSV file. Um, and then we want to split our data into 70% training data and 30% testing data. Uh, and this is just general practice when working uh, with uh, AI. And then we'll go ahead and uh, train our AI. After we're finished training, we'll go ahead and display how many emails we, train, we trained against, and then we'll go ahead and start testing. Um, and then we have variables here, which are just used for some statistics, um, so we can evaluate how well our classifier did after we we're done uh, testing uh, the classifier. And then this for loop here um, classifies each email in the testing set uh, one at a time and then um, adds to the statistics, essentially. Um, so does anyone have any questions on what we've covered so far? Okay, great. So now that we've gotten over all that stuff, we can focus on implementing the different parts of the classifier. Um, and so for the actual classifier um, problem, we have two main propositions. Uh, we have A, and that is the spam status of an email, whether or not it's spam or ham. And then B is the actual contents of the email. Um, and so using Bayes' theorem, we can derive the inequality if um, the probability of B given A times the probability of A is greater than the probability of B given not A um, times the probability of uh, not A is, I'm sorry, is um, greater than, right? And so this is how we determine whether or not an email is, is spam. Um, so first we need to know how to train our cl classifier and get the probability of um, a certain email being spam or being not spam. So we'll go ahead and start with the train function. Uh, so first what we need to do is establish some variables. So we'll do total emails, set that equal to zero. Then we will also take spam emails Yes. Yes. Let me see if I can. Is that better? Any more? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, okay. So then we'll set uh, spam emails equal to zero, and these will just count uh, how many uh, total emails we count and how many spam emails that we um, evaluate during our training process. Uh, so now we want to go through each email in our data set. So for email in our data set, which is given as a parameter to the function. And then we want to check to see if it is spam. So we'll set the variable is spam equal to self dot underscore email is spam. And that's one of our helper functions that helps us uh, just get whether or not the email is spam. We'll go ahead and give it the email. Right, so now that we have uh, whether or not the email is spam, right, so uh, we need to handle both cases. So if it is spam, then we want to add one to spam emails. All right, and then we also want to add uh, one to total emails every time as well. And then um, we need to evaluate each of our emails. So I do self dot underscore evaluate uh, email and we'll give it email and is spam. So we haven't written this function yet. We'll, we're actually writing it right after, um, but we will get to that in just a second. And then after we've evaluated all of our emails, we can go ahead and um, determine the probability that an email is spam. Um, and the probability that is not spam. So we'll set the probability of A equal to uh, spam emails divided by total emails, right? And so the probability of not A will just be, be the total emails minus the number of spam emails that we uh, trained against uh, divided by the total number of emails, right? And that should be all for our train, training function. Uh, so then we'll move on to how we evaluate emails. Um, 
And like I said before, we'll be using the um, bag of words model. So if the email is spam, we'll add that word to the spam dictionary and keep track of its occurrences. And if it's ham, add it to the ham dictionary, keep track of all the ham occurrences. Um, so to do that, we will go through each word in the email. So for, what was it up here? For uh, word in self dot, I think the helper function is get email words. So the get email words, we'll go ahead and give it the email. So um, self dot underscore get email words is just a generator that gives us each word one at a time. Um, then from there, uh, we have self.total words, which is the um, variable that we establish in our init function for the class. So total words, we're going to add one to that every time um, we evaluate a word. And then if uh, the email that we're currently evaluating is spam, we'll go ahead and add a word or add that uh, specific word to the spam dictionary. Um, and I believe there's also a helper function for that as well. So we're going to go self uh, dot underscore add word. Got an extra dash in here. Let's move this up. And we'll give it the word and the dictionary. So it'll be self dot underscore spam words. And that's our spam dictionary. Um, and so if it's not a spam word, we can backspace enough. Oh, I forgot one thing. So when we add it to the dictionary, we also need to keep track of the total number of words for spam. So self so underscore spam words, spam total, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see, spam total plus equals one. So we'll increment that counter, and then we also uh, then we'll deal with the case when the email is not spam. So self dot underscore add word again. We're going to give it the word, but we're going to give it a different dictionary. So this time it will be ham words, and then we can go ahead and increment um, ham total by one every time, and that should be all we need to do. So it's um, accessing these dictionaries directly and uh, directly mutating them so we don't have to return any values. Um, and that should be everything that we need for uh, the training part of our function. Does anyone have any questions on anything that we've gone over so far? Okay, awesome. So now that we've trained our classifier, uh, the next step is to test. And uh, to do this, we need to calculate the probability of B given A and the probability of B given not A. Uh, in order to determine this probability that an email is spam or not given its contents, we just need to take the, prob uh, the product of all the probabilities for each word in the email. Um, so this will be, uh, we'll write that in the conditional email probability function. So um, we'll initialize the probability to be one. Um, and then we'll go through each word in the email. So for word in self so uh, get email words of uh, word, no, I'm sorry, email. And then we'll multiply our probability by um, the, the conditional word probability for uh, each word in that email. So self dot conditional word probability probability. There we go. And it actually is just prob, so that's fine. And then uh, we'll give it word, the, the current word that we're on. And we'll give it whether or not uh, the email is spam, uh, which is also given as a parameter to this function. And then after we've gone through every word in the email, go ahead and just return our probability. 
And that should be it for that function. So now we need to implement our conditional word probability. Uh, and this is a little more involved. So we're given uh, the word and whether or not the email is going to be considered as spam. And if it is spam, we will go ahead and return self dot underscore. We want to get all the uh, occurrences of the word and divide it by the total number of uh, spam words that we have evaluated so far. So that will be the helper function for that is get word occurrences. And we'll go ahead and give it the word. And since it is spam, we'll go ahead and give it um, the spam dictionary. So self dot underscore spam words. And then we'll go ahead and divide that by um, the uh, we'll go ahead and divide that by the total number of spam words. So that should be that. All right. And then if the email isn't spam, we can go ahead and just return self dot underscore get word occurrences uh, we'll give it the word and we'll give it the correct dictionary so this will be ham words and then we'll go ahead and divide that by the total number of um, ham words that we have evaluated so far so does that make sense to everyone as well Awesome. Okay, so we're pretty much done with, um, with this so far. So all we need to do is write our main classify function. So like I stated before, uh, we need to calculate the probability that the email is spam and the probability that the email is not spam. So we'll go ahead and create a variable called is spam. And we'll set this equal to the conditional since it is a class self dot conditional, wow, that was bad. Conditional email probability, and we'll go ahead and give it um, the email. And then, since we're assuming that it is spam, we'll go ahead and just give it a boolean value of true. And then we will establish another variable called not spam. And we'll set this equal to the conditional email probability. And we'll give it the email. And then this time, we're assuming that it's false. All right? And so once we get both of those values, we'll go ahead and just return whether or not is spam is greater than not spam. All right? So remember, if is spam is greater than not spam, that means it's a spam email. And we can just return this uh, inequality because it will evaluate as a Boolean uh, value and uh, give us the result that we want. And so, wow, look, all the, all the code's already put together down here. It looks like I didn't need to code anything that whole time. Uh, so, yeah, we have the entire class at the bottom of the file all put together. Um, so we can go ahead and run it and train and see what our results are. running right now all right and so these are the results so we trained on 3600 emails a little over 3600 and then we tested on a little over 1500 emails um, so our testing set breakdown there were um, 449 spam emails and 1097 ham emails uh, we correctly identified 349 as spam emails which is pretty good and we correctly identified 1072 uh, hem emails, which is also pretty good. And so uh, we have here 92% accuracy uh, for our identifier, which is uh, roughly expected from a naive Bayes classifier. So does anyone have any questions about anything, any of the coding part, or of any of the before part? All right, awesome. So. Um, before we actually end today, oh, actually, one more thing I wanted to show. Um, this code down here is what I use to import the CSV file um, into Google Collab. Um, so this is just available for you guys for reference. Um, it just authenticates um, the PyDrive client. Uh, so it essentially allows Google Collab access to your Google Drive. Uh, and then it gets the file, and this ID 
and this is the uh, ID for the CSV file in my Google Drive. Um, and how you get this is you just right click on the file, uh, and you click on get shareable link, and then at the very end there's, it says like ID equals, and then you just copy that big string. Um, and that should give you access. Uh, and then this just reads the file and makes it usable. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and then, yes, one last thing before we end today. Um, so I want to talk about how we can improve our classifier. So while 92% is uh, a pretty good rating, right? We can always, or pretty good accuracy percentage, we can always do better. Um, so I want to talk about some possible ways that we can improve upon what we programmed today. Um, so first, we can implement n-grams, which is what we talked about before, where um, the naive Bayes classifier treats each variable as independent from each other. Um, but n-grams, what it does is it allows the classifier to evaluate groups of words, or even whole sentences of words. Um, so it'll allow us to tell the difference between very good and not good, uh, and that can increase our accuracy. Um, second thing we could implement is tokenization, which essentially allows us to tell the difference between, you know, the, the word free capitalized or the word free, um, you know, all lowercase, right? If the word free is, is all uppercase, then we know that uh, it, it, it's probably, it may, it might be more likely uh, to be a spam email or occur in a spam email. Um, where if it's all lowercase, it might be used in just a normal email uh, using normal everyday parlance. Um, a third way that we can improve is by implementing TF-IDF or term frequency inverse document frequency, um, which is just a numerical statistic that is intended to reflect um, how important a word is in a document. And then lastly, uh, we can implement Laplace smoothing. Um, so we did like a very like soft version of this today in our implementation. Um, but all this allows us to do is really handle words that we haven't seen before and um, uh, or we haven't encountered while training our classifier. Um, and it, it just increases the accuracy just a little bit usually. Um, and I believe that is all. Any questions? All right, awesome. Thank you guys so much. I hope you guys learned some stuff, had some fun. AI, yeah? Cool. Well, thank you. Yeah, and there's more pizza and snacks. If that made you hungry. <laughs>